2009, I took an intensive workshop with Paul Stanitz, who was the originator of Fungi Perfecti, where I got this shirt. That was a great experience and gave us a taste for what fungi can do in a lab environment. I'm more interested in how to cultivate these types of different types of mushrooms in a more of a home-based farm scale environment, in a more low-tech way, because that's where most of us are operating at. Most of us don't have labs in our in our farmscapes. But most of us have access to logs and weedy grasses and a straw and leaves and branches, all of which we can grow fungi on. Does anyone recognize this log? Oh, you can't say what it is. From a distance, it grows in the national park as a weedy tree, it's a nitrogen fixer, competes quite closely with the ohia. No, it's, it's not actually in the legume family. It, this is fire, Morella fire, the fire tree that's rapidly overcompeting ohia. So we can turn, we can get food from wood that's also culling a problem. We can, we can grow most oyster mushrooms on different weedy species in Hawaii. Albizia is one of the only exceptions to that. In terms of the different types of fungi, so I, I have about 10 minutes, right? And then we'll go for, into Q&A for another 10. Okay. In terms of the different types of fungi, there's the saprophytes, which are the organisms that uh, consume lignin and cellulose in our environment. Lignin, lignin is the hardening agent in wood, and cellulose helps with uh, transport of nutrients and uh, creates strong, health, strong healthy cell walls and plants. So if, we, if it weren't for fungi, as we know, we'd be surrounded by a lot of woody debris. Thank goodness for fungi. So saprophytes are the lignin and cellulose decomposing fungi. There's the mycorrhizal organ of fungi that lives in the soil that, that help with nutrient exchange. There's the so, uh, there's the parasites which attack living trees. The, the largest organism in the world is a mushroom in eastern Oregon that's attacking a, a full 2,200-acre forest. It, the, no, the organism is 2,200 acres in size. So the saprophytes, mycorrhizal fungi, parasitic fungi, and we also have the endophytic fungi, which are the fungi that live inside plants. It's recently been discovered that half of, roughly half of the, the cells in plants aren't plant cells at all, they're fung fungal cells. <laughs> but I'm mainly interested in how to, how to turn wood into food and medicine. Oysters are what is growing on this, these straw, uh, these two bags of straw, and they're the easiest to grow. With a, of the 13 uh, workshops I've taught in mushroom cultivation over the past two and a half years, I always have students go home with a, a bag of oyster mushrooms because they're just so easy. All you need to do is water the bag once a day and mushrooms pop out after two, maybe three weeks. Logs are a bit more finicky. Oysters, like I said, will grow on most of the weedy logs here in Hawaii, except Albizia. This log has been inoculated with shiitake. Uh, my good friend Eddie Richter, who lives up in Honoka, he grows uh, shiitake for the high-end re uh, restaurants on, the, on both sides of the island. And I buy my sawdust from him. So these kits are entirely local. You can grow out the sa sawdust spawn for oyster. And I go into greater detail on what sawdust spawn is in, in, in my different workshops. You can also grow mushrooms on pretty much any cellulose-based material. That, that includes grass, wood chips, paper. What, what else is cellulose-based? The gas. The gas works really well. Works really well. Hair even works. 
Hair is really good because it has lots of protein in it. Lots of nitrogen. <laughs> Just saying. Anything else? How about macnut hull? That'll work. You said cardboard already. How about hats? I inoculated this hat with oyster mushrooms about eight months ago. So you're now all being sporulated with oyster mushrooms. Wherever I walk around, I try to wear this hat. <laughs> what else do I want to say? Oh, I have it my little cute, cute, cute. Protein from mushrooms can, can be as high as 40%. Mushrooms can be as high as 40% protein, depending on the mushroom species. Another really easy to grow mushroom that grows here in Hawaii, but we can't import it, and it's highly medicinal, is the reishi mushroom. You've heard of that mushroom. It's famous in Chinese medicine. And we can't import it here because it attacks ohia and a couple of other native trees. But it's already here. So we can, we can legally cultivate it in a lab environment or a home-based outside, outside lab environment. It's, it's arguably more aggressive than oyster mushrooms. And it's shown to reverse uh, cancer and has all sorts of immune boosting properties. Oysters are mainly thought of as an, an edible mushroom, but they also have highly medicinal qualities as well. They, they lower cholesterol, they're antiviral, anti-cancer. Anti, uh, and that's true of most uh, mushrooms. We were wandering around today in, in the forest up by Old Kala, and we found the pepeyan mushroom. Who's seen that one? It looks like an ear. The, the scientific name is auricularia, which means ear in, in um, Latin. There's also another easy one to grow is the turkey tail. It's the most, most common mushroom globally. The only place it isn't found uh, worldwide is Antarctica. It's pretty much found every other place that has, that has um, woody debris. And it's great to tincture up. I don't have any of my tinctures here. What about lion's mane? Lion's mane, I haven't grown that one out here. I've grown it out in a lab environment. But it's, it's fairly aggressive, too. Yeah, I think that's about all I wanted to say. And I wanted to open it up for questions, Q&A. My next workshop is probably going to be in Volcano, but I'm in, in May at the Volcano Arts Center. But I might try to host one up in Hamakua. I'll get to teach a workshop up there. I might have it at Akiko's D&D in Wailua. Why layer? Okay, so let's open it up for Q and A. Yeah. When you're growing mushrooms, how do you know you're not getting a bad spore that flies in that's poisonous? Oh, good question. How do we figure out that we're not growing an undesirable mushroom? Once you start working with mushrooms, you, you get a clear sense of what they are based on the smell. They have a really each individual mushroom has a, has a distinct smell. And you can also test for the specific type of mushroom using um, morphological features, how, how the mushroom forms, and also it's a good idea to take a spore print where you take the mushroom, cut it in half, put one half on a white piece of paper and the other half on a black piece of paper. And sometimes the spores are different colors, so that's why you have a white and a black sheet. That's another way to ID the mushroom. But I'm I, I'm well acquainted with the mushrooms I grow, so I know this is oyster. There's actually, this is pearl oyster, and there's about seven different tropical specific uh, oyster cultivars that work really well here. Phoenix oyster is a, is a delicious one that has a bit of a pinkish hue. And I do sell these mushroom kits. I have a bunch in my car and also water. Any other questions? Other questions? Have you ever grown shiitake mushrooms? That's what will be popping out of this log in about a year. Because straw has a much higher surface ratio, uh, surface area than logs, it's much easier for the mycelium to colonize it, as opposed to this doesn't have very much surface area at all. So it takes a while for the mushrooms to pop out, colonizes. 
pretty hard lignin cellulose. So shiitake can grow, it mainly grows on, on oaks. Shi she means oak in, in yeah. Japanese, I'm pretty sure. Shiitake means much, uh, oik, uh, oak mushroom. And shiitake prefers really hard hardwood, which Faya is, koa is not, it can also pop out of koa. How do you see it being um, an agricultural crop? Um, you know, money is not crop. Here. Great, great question. That's a great question. I've been uh, researching forest farming. I'm here, growing up, teaching an agroforestry class through the through UH Hilo. And one topic that folks have been researching on the mainland is growing different types of mushrooms on logs in a forested environment at 80% shade and watering it once a day and marketing the mushrooms that pop out after a year to different high-end restaurants. We could also do this with we can do this with edible mushrooms and highly medicinal mushrooms. I think there's a, an open market for growing reishi on this island. Growing reishi, powdering it up, putting it in capsule form, and selling it at the supermarkets and island naturals and farmers markets. Yeah, I was watching a documentary on Netflix, and um, there's like mushroom <coughs> hunters, uh -huh. and then you go up in the forest, and then they they're like, oh, chickens here and roosters there, and then you know they're gathering up the, the mushrooms on the box in the box. And but, so that's more that's wild harvesting. Wild harvesting. Then that has a place. It's, it's more difficult to do here in Hawaii, just because most of our mushrooms fruit at higher elevations. We have a lot more diversity of mushrooms here in the islands and even on, on the continent. But most of the mushrooms are very, very small. And most of them aren't choice edibles because they're so small. And we haven't really looked into the medicinal properties of them yet. So in terms of farming, I think, I'm starting to sell these bags at the farmer's market. I sold 20 a couple weeks ago. I sold out, but that was kind of neat to, to experience. So I think there's an open market for selling these at the farmer's market in value-added form and in other creative avenues. Drink. Uh, I have a question. Um, what causes a mushroom to fruit? Right, okay, that's a good question. It's in a natural environment. It's a combination of the right amount of light Contrary to popular belief, mushrooms do need a certain amount of light. It's usually dappled light, the type of light you'd see in a forested environment. Combination of light causes them to fruit, with a certain amount of water, about 60% water. The consistency of a wrung out sponge is what I tried to think of. The consistency of good quality compost. <laughs> Enough food so that they've <laughs> been able to consume enough to actually produce a mushroom and also a drop in temperature. That can be induced by soaking a log in water overnight or if you're in a more of a lab environment, you can drop the temperature in, in a lab. But in a, in a home-based environment, you usually see mushrooms popping out in winter or at nighttime. Yeah, you see mushrooms that have formed overnight after the temperature has dropped. Okay. Um, so another question is, are you making your own spores to put in there? I'm making my own mycelium. The spores are sent out of each mushroom itself. Sometimes a million spores are released on any given day. And the spores that are released can consume different substrates. And as they consume the different substrates, they start to form what's called a hyphal knot. They start running across the material, form a hyphal knot, and that's the beginning of the mycelium that we see when we kick over a log or when we culture IMO. Question back there? What's the best way to collect the spores that fall out? Ooh. You can use them to cultivate new ones. 
You put a hat underneath like I did. Uh, you can put a, 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 tish, a petri dish underneath with agar agar. Remember that stuff from back in uh, high school lab science? That's a good way. You can also just put material, <coughs> even coffee grounds opened up that you've stored in the freezer. You can, you can use that as a simple way to collect them. You can also put, put them on um, glass. That's often a, a way that uh, professional cultivators capture spores. Put it on glass and sandwich another piece of glass on top of the spores and store them that way. It's, it's, it's more difficult to collect them uh, from the wild. Yeah. Um, a while back, I was walking out in the field for, with a couple, and there was big cow patties all over, and I said, hey, look, there's mushrooms growing out of there. And the guy was from India, and he reached down and grabbed those mushrooms and started stuffing them in his mouth. And uh, <laughs> there's a wide variety of mushrooms. You know I only teach the edible and medicinal um, growing <laughs> types, but the same principles apply for whatever type of mushroom you're growing. So he said, well, since he was from India, if anything that grows in a cow patty is okay. So Depending on the quantity, <laughs> that's my cat. Right, not mine. <laughs> Psilocybin mushrooms will also grow on straws. Is he still living? Any other questions from this corner? Oh, here's one. Um, if, uh, will medicinal mushrooms grow in the earth, like permanently? Usually with this. Like edibles, like oysters. Most of the manure-based mushrooms are what we think of as, well, well they're, they're, we cultivate portobellos in okay. manure, white button mushrooms, uh, cremini mushrooms also grow out of manure. So those are what type? Saprophytes, they're like in the lignin and cellulose that's in the manure, and, uh, and other nutrients. Here's a fun factoid, the first organism to come to land was a fungus. What well, could they digest if there wasn't any, any soil on the land? They could digest rocks. That makes me think back to a quote that you told me, Drake, of uh, the, the agricultural land that is South Kohala, all that lava fields. Any other questions? No, when you, you hang that up, you hang the bags up. You can either hang it or open up the top and have a mushroom bouquet put out. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's kind of impressive. And like, you can continue to harvest as soon as you took one year off? Yep, you just uh, harvest it as close to the bag as you can and continue watering it. There's a certain lifespan to these kits, which is about five or six fruitings over a two month period. It gets to be a bit of a loose science outside of a lab environment when, when there's other variables like, like water and light and air and nutrients that come into play. But usually about two months, five feet for oyster. And which one is the one that's out in the forest that's usually on rotted wood? It's uh, orange. Oh, that's a type of jelly mushroom. That, that one's edible. Great. It's hard to collect those bunches though. But at least if you need it. It kind of looks like the shape of the ear. And oh, it's kind of contemplating as to whether it was uh, is, it, is it brownish yellow? Uh, it's kind of like yellow the color. Orange. It's kind of like that orange right there. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Pepe out sometimes is that bright of a color. Yeah. It's quite a bit of. You know. Especially they, they typically grow on how and cocoons. That have you seen them grow? Well, right? um, I've had a lot of like. Uh, not Albizia, well, Albizia, I, ne I never see nothing come out of Albizia, but uh, uh, mostly the other ones that uh, the sheep and the goats like to eat the leaves okay. a lot, uh, full nitrogen stuff, you know, it breaks down real fast. Yeah. Yeah. One thing with uh, uh, that made me, you know, your comment made me think about the different antifungal agents in wood. Usually you have to after you chop a piece of wood down and you're ready to inoculate it with your chosen mushroom, 
it's best to wait a good two weeks for the antifungal agents of the wood to dissipate. It took about two weeks for those to go away. And then we can inoculate it with our chosen mushroom. Other, other mushroom, other logs that I've grown mushrooms on include gunpowder, ohia, koa, faya, and those are the main ones that I've grown in a lot of. Strawberry guava? Strawberry guava will work on both, yeah. Like a regular guava. The thing is, why would it take a year to uh, uh, form uh, uh, the, the mushroom? I mean, does it have? Does the wood have to break down first? Exactly. The, the it has to break down by the by the mycelium in the wood consuming it. Each of these spots where you see wax is an inoculation point. I plugged it with sawdust, spun up shiitake, and it just takes a while for the mycelium to colonize all this hard pigment inside there. Mm. It doesn't wash off any time or I mean something that you would also uh, like water every day. This can be watered once every three or four days. Usually I uh, stick the logs in sand about a third of the way in and that gives the, the log a constant stream of moisture. It's, it, 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 the, the, you're saying that the wax won't wash off? Yeah, well, anything, the, the fungus itself. The fungus, uh, it's like us. It's, we're more closely related to fungi than we are to plants. We're in the same larger kingdom. You guys have probably talked about this, right? <laughs> sure. <laughs> we're more closely related to fungi than we are to plants. But we, we exhale carbon um, oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide, we inhale oxygen, just like fungi do. do. They have externalized stomachs, we have internalized stomachs. So the, inter the externalized stomach of the mycelium is what consumes logs and straw and hats and paper bags. Well, the, the, the fungi just essentially colonize all that wood. Exactly. Yeah. So you, they won't wash away. No, can't they, they inhabit the entire right. log. Mm -hmm. so Another, I, I would just want to say. I think, I think, I think she had a question. Why won't it grow on the albizia? I think the albizia has a longer uh, period that it keeps those antifungal agents. Mm -hmm. And it's just the softer wood in general. It decomposes more readily. I think in part, I haven't, I haven't studied why that is too much, but I've, I've tried different mushrooms on albizia. One of them beat it out. Lately, I've seen powdery yellow um, substance or powdery orange things that are on the ground. Uh -huh. are, they, are they fungus? If I'm thinking of the type of, if we're thinking of the same thing, those are different types of fungi. Yeah. Yeah. And they sometimes are raised off the ground maybe at half an inch or an inch. Right. Yeah, that's the type of fungus. And Is sometimes they're, they're growing in piles of leaves. Yes. Yeah. Are they edible? Not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. So, do you think it would be possible to accelerate and or extend your fruiting if you were to mix in natural farming inputs? Or, for instance, something you may be familiar with, like humic or fulvic acids when you're watering them? Yeah, you can, you can add other things to extend the life of your oyster mushroom or mushroom bag. You can even pour old motor oil <laughs> onto the bag, which renders the oyster mushrooms inedible, but it gives them a bolst of carbon and hydrogen, which they'll, they'll consume. <laughs> and it, it works, it, it works. But it, we're talking about edible things. <laughs> it's good to see though, it just start popping out of the bag. I think you have another question. Yeah, I just wanted to point out there's I, there, there's a lot of research on research on turkey tail as well, and very strong in cancer uh, benefits. And right. that's that's a ubiquitous mushroom that would have some benefit here as well. Right. In terms of medicinal. Mm -hmm. 
Another good way to grow mushrooms, other than straw and bags and on logs, is to inoculate actual stumps. By inoculating stumps, you're creating a long-term environment for the mushrooms to, to grow on, sometimes for decades. Think about all the woody debris, wood, woody organic matter that's underneath that, that stump. And I think this is also another way to kill trees, too. There, there's uh, fungal sprays that you can spray onto uh, to logs, but you can also wrap rope that's been colonized with mushrooms onto cuts in the log. And also we can sporulate, we can inoculate our chainsaw oil with mushrooms, with, 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 with spores, and inoculate as we cut. <laughs> we can also take, take wedges out of a piece of log, put sawdust in that same wedge, and then wrap it with tape or I've, I've mainly used other other rope to wrap it around it. That's a, that's a triple inoculation that you can do. You can chop the, the log with a saw with a chainsaw, do the wedge technique, and also wrap it with a colonized piece of, of rope. That will almost guarantee that you have mushrooms fruiting out of that stump. Now, and the stumps, fresh cut stumps, or how long does it sit? Um, it's it's best to cut within, again, two weeks. Within two weeks? Yeah, so that the antifungal agents in that stump will... Uh, and older will, ones than that are not useful? It, it'll still work on older ones, because most stumps are still living even after you chop them down. Certain... You guys know about coppicing? Trees that will coppice, that will send out suckers, to grow m mushrooms really well. Can you grow more than one kind of mushroom on the same stump? Yes, you can. I've seen the armillaria mushroom, which is the honey mushroom on the mainland, growing right next to turkey tail. And yeah, I've seen at least two mushrooms growing out of the same stump. But at, at a certain point, they're going to have a battle of the, of the, of the ligand, over the ligand. David, do you have a question? Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you've seen the, uh, or positively identified the turkey tail. Do I see a, a similar species? It, it doesn't have a real, like, vivid colors. Found Mel Silva, but I haven't found it with the turkey tail yet. The turkey tail doesn't usually have a full ring. It's usually a, a partial, partial cap. And the colors are somewhat muted here. There's, there's one that looks very similar to the turkey. Yes, I have found it. It's here. Yeah. Zach. Does the Strophario grow here? The King Strophario will grow here. I have yet to bring it in. We can import it, though. And that's a great one to grow in the garden. It grows on wood chips. It's from the eastern part of North America. And it would grow preferably at higher elevations in Hawaii, places like Volcano and Mountain View, Coloco Balco. How about eating one? Right now? Yeah. Oh, it's always best to cook mushrooms. Why is that? The, the enzymes that are in mushrooms are only digestible by our body if they're cooked, if they're heated. So even the garden, even the garden buffet mushrooms that we see in places, we should really be cooking those. It makes them more assimilable to our bodies. I've seen a mushroom here that looks just like the puffballs we used to see in Idaho. Are they are they here too? Most puffballs are edible, not all of them, but the vast majority of them are. Okay. The biggest mushroom I've ever seen, I showed this in a couple of my mushroom cultivation classes, was twice as big as this bag. And it, it, it popped out of the ground after Hurricane Irene rolled through on the East Coast. And I think the storm somehow induced the mushroom to fruit. That's my hypothesis. It's not a theory, I haven't proven that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So, um, so it's good to cook your mushroom. What about dried mushrooms? Dried mushrooms in terms of uh, rehydrating them to consume? Just like how it's better to cook them, or like dried mushrooms instead of frozen? 
it's always best to cook mushrooms. Well, I'm not quite sure of your question. How do you consume dried mushrooms? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Or you can powder it up, and we take it in pill form that way. You can re you can rehydrate dried mushrooms by pouring um, hydrogen peroxide on them. Which, let's think about what hydrogen peroxide is, right? It's it's water and another oxygen. H two O two. Pretty. And that, that will oxygenate and rehydrate mushrooms. Cooking methods. Cooking methods. Low heat. It's best not to burn mushrooms because they then become carcinogenic, like most foods that are burned. I, I mainly put them in stir fries. I think that'd be a great, great uh, addition to those uh, Mongolian barbecues you sometimes have here in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Having a uh, mushroom option. What other mushrooms have you guys consumed in the past here? Other than the ones we've talked about. Morel. Morel. Here in Hawaii. Not morel. Someone's growing morels on Maui, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. Morels are very difficult to cultivate, but somehow she's doing it. Um, also, chanterelles are very difficult to cultivate. So if you can find those mushrooms that are very lucrative, that's also another, another farming product. Here. Oh. And these are grown in a controlled environment, or do you not, like not. to go out like, into a forest area where there's water, you know, fern shoots all over the place, and you know a lot of shade, and it hang those things up. Don't you think it'll cultivate a lot better? These are growing on my back porch, and I just I'm watering them once a day. Regular water or rainwater? This is uh, county water that I let off gas. Uh, I let the chlorine off gas overnight, so it's essentially non chlorinated water at that point. And then the logs you can put in a spot. So in a similar place to a compost pile, it, 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 there's so much, some shade, but you can certainly grow it in, in a forest environment. I, I was, uh, this past week I was at the Permaculture Voices student uh, conference in San Diego, and Paul Bemis was there. And he said something I'd never heard before, and I keep meaning to check it out, but he said that the shiitakes are the best source of vitamin D on the planet, right. especially if you expose them to sunlight mm -hmm. for two hours. Turn them upside down. Yeah, before mm -hmm. you cook them. That they have the, the highest concentration of vitamin D on the planet. Right. It's a great uh, great source of vitamin D for folks who live in uh, cloudy areas like Seattle and who suffer from seasonal affective disorder. Here in Hawaii, we probably have arguably more vitamin D than we need. At least I do, as, as someone who spends a lot of time outside. Are you, I'm you saying you inoculate? Out. You say you inoculate? Can you go like like separate and when that matures or gets ready to eat? I'm not sure what the seeding process is. Spores. Can you just go like this and then like go throw them on a whole log and it'll come up? Like how to, how, how, like. how to how to move relatively spent material onto fresh material? That is something I go into detail in on my on my my mushrooms in the landscape workshop. But to give you a brief sense, you can move Sawdust spawn onto sawdust spawn being the mycelium that's colonized sawdust. You can move that onto straw fairly easily, but from straw to straw, it, the, the strain becomes slightly less vigorous, not guaranteed to work. That's just the, the nature of uh, how fungi consume this type of material. Some people put their spent uh, straw around fruit trees, and around uh, in, in their yard, and they do have mushrooms pop up. The King's Trafaria is a great, great one for that. You can definitely get import that one. Are truffles similar to mushrooms? 
Truffles are a type of mushroom. Where do you see the They, I have seen them here. I have never, I haven't, I have yet to delve into cultivating truffles. They take a while. They take, they, they're a mycorrhizal fun, fungus group, which means that the fungus pairs with the plant and then roots out the mushroom. In Italy, there's a long tradition of uh, truffle cultivation, and they hire uh, purebred pigs to sniff out those high-quality truffles. That could be something that emerges here as a as a lucrative <laughs> side. <laughs> Maybe we need to uh, start breeding truffle pigs. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Other things we can grow mushrooms on that we have lots of here is coffee beans. Last year, let's see, in 2012, on this island, there was, according to the Department of Agriculture in Hawaii, there was 22 million pounds of spent coffee, the coffee fruit that was discarded. A lot of that was sent or put around fruit trees, but to act as a, as a slow release compost. But we could also run them through oyster mushrooms first, have them fruit out, and then compost them underneath our fruit trees. 22 million pounds. You mean the grown, the coffee grown? The, the spent pulp, after you oh, take okay. out, take off the coffee and the seed, the bean itself, that, that fruit. That's often a, uh, a money maker in third world countries, but we have yet to really tap that on this island. And coffee is moving more and more into East Hawaii, as we see this. Uh, there's Hilo Coffee Mill up in uh, not Hilo, but not Hilo. and uh, Kau Coffee Mill. By Peel Coffee is really good. So if we could, someone could create a micro business just around harvesting the, the spent material. Also, you can grow it on. Um, you can grow mushrooms on spent uh, brew, brewery grain from places like Kona Brewery. No one's, no one's harvesting that right now. So a lot of the, the waste material, people are recognizing things like wood chips are harder and harder to come by now because people are bringing them into the landscape. There's still harvestable, quote unquote, waste resources that we can turn into edible and medicinal food. So I see a couple people reaching for their stomachs. No, I don't. <laughs> I have one question. You, you mentioned that. The oyster grows on the coffee uh, waves as a sub mm -hmm. substrate. Is that the is that the best variety, or will shiitake or any of the others grow on it? Shiitake does not. Uh, reishi would. Mm -hmm. For some reason, shiitake is more particular. Mm -hmm. What, what about the king's trefire? King's trefire likes so woody, yeah. woody material, not, not so much cool. coffee grounds. Cool. 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 Any last minute questions before? Michigan, you harvested my taffy for Hen of the Woods uh -huh. under the oak. Yes. Can you, can you, uh... I've seen my taffy growing underneath koa trees in Kituka <coughs> up in Bird Park, in the National Park. It, it, it does grow here. There's, a, there's a, a lot of room for experimenting with that in the, the more, more discoveries are being made by amateur mycologists right now than professional mycologists. And what Hawaii doesn't have right now is a myco mycological society. Pretty much every other state has a mycological society. I guess this is a version, but yeah, this is a version of a mycological society. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll put that loosely in that category. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I think it would be great to start figuring out how to utilize fungi. I mean, we really, really even talked about all their applications outside the, of the landscape. <coughs> Thanks for your attention, and uh, I have my business cards up here if you want to get touched by it. Yeah.